right, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. I'm going to put that over here out the way. John chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 45 through 53. And today we're going to look at the reactions to the resurrection. How you react and respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ will, depend, will determine the meaning of your life here and all of your life hereafter. Without the proper response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are void of hope. There is no hope here. There is no hope hereafter. And so it's interesting that uh, there are a number of responses uh, to the resurrection. Those in disbelief, those in semi-belief, and then those who are sold out. And so today we're going to look at the, the reactions of the resurrection in this passage. And, and I want you to, to go back with me, go to the next slide, uh, go back and, and review that what we talked about last week. Remember that Jesus works always illustrated his words. That as when Jesus did miraculous works, whatever work he did, it was an illustration of the words or the teaching that he provided. So when he said, I am the bread of life, he then fed 5,000 people. All right? uh, when he talked about, hey, I am the resurrection. And as he looked at that, uh, he said, he rose Lazarus from the dead. And so as you look at all of these things, all of Jesus' miracles are tied intrinsically and powerfully to his teaching and his word. And so uh, if you look what uh, in John chapter 10, verse 25, he said, I did tell you, and you don't believe Jesus answered them, the works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. They're asking, who are you? Are you going to tell us who you are? I said, I told you. You didn't buy it. You didn't believe it. But my works, my words testify, the works that I do, my Father's name testify about me. In John 5, 36, I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I'm doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. So uh, keep that in mind. So everything that Jesus has done has been an illustration of God at work in him and, and also an illustration of the teaching that he provides. And John is very, uh, uh, very uh, consistent in providing uh, that tie between the teaching and then the works of Christ. And so today, uh, we want to go and look at John chapter 11, uh, verse 45 through 54. Go ahead and go to the next one for me. There we go. So let's, let's read this here. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. So previously we had seen that Jesus had, uh, ra had raised Lazarus from the dead after he'd been in the tomb for four days. He'd raised him from the dead. And so there were many that saw this, and they believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and said, What are we going to do? This man does so many signs. If we let him continue in this way, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come, and they will remove both our place and our nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, who is a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. If he's in Oklahoma, he said, You're plum ignorant. <laughs> right? You don't know anything. You're not considering that it is to your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. Now, he did this. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. However, Jesus was going, he did not understand why Jesus was going to die for the nation. Caiaphas spoke those words, but in his mind it was so they could preserve their political standing and their religious status and their economic standing. And not for the nation also. John adds this editorial. That he wasn't going to die for the nation also, but also for the, unite, to unite the scattered children of God. And so from that day on, they plotted to kill him. Now it's interesting, you would think that a guy comes to town raises someone from the dead, that we would kind of have a uniform response on that. That's 
really cool. What a great and awesome thing. But I want you to notice there's three kinds of response that you will see uh, in the Bible uh, to, the res- to the resurrection of Christ. And, and we're going to go in reverse order on this. We're going to start with the negative, and then we're going to end with the positive, okay? And, and so as we look at this passage, it's after the resurrection of Lazarus, it's after that mighty work, and there's some who believe, and then some went straight to the Pharisees to tell them. And their response to this, well... It was like the response of many today, go to the next one, hostility and conflict. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he faced hostilities and conflict. He had the hometown hostilities in Nazareth. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. Uh, There are multiple times that people wanted to, to, they didn't want to lay hands on him, they wanted to throw hands at him. Right? You know, and, and so we look at that, And so he had the hometown hostilities. Throughout his ministry, you had the religious leadership, the priesthood and the Pharisees and the Sadducees all disputing, trying to to find fault, trying to to find a way that they could get rid of him because they saw him as a threat. Uh, And they desired to uh, to, to protect their status quo and their their lifestyle. And, and, And if you look at this passage, Caiaphas says, don't you, you don't get it. We gotta get rid of this guy. It's better for the nation if this one man dies. Now, he was not doing something noble for Christ, noble for the gospel. He was doing something that was economically feasible and politically powerful for him. Now, you ever heard that old saying? The more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, there are those who would try to manipulate and to use uh, the political system to preserve power rather than serve God and serve the people. Now, I'm going to say this. That's not a bipartisan problem. That's not a partisan problem. That's a bipartisan problem. All right? We're we're not going to make this a political issue for us, but understand that when it comes down to it, I love being an American. That's a wonderful thing. However... If our leadership serves the gods of this world and stands in hostile conflict towards the words of Christ, then my first loyalty is to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross. The flag's a beautiful thing, but the flag will not carry me to heaven. I have to kneel at the cross. And so as we look at this, here they were, they were trying, uh, they greeted this resurrection power, they greeted this work with hostility and conflict. They would choose assassination over belief. They would kill the messenger rather than be redeemed by the message. They would choose a, a, a murder, a lynching to save their status quo, their position over acceptance and deliverance. Hostility towards Jesus is hostility towards the hope of, humani- of humanity. And it's just like the world that we live in. Our culture is dominated by the big three. And there was a book that was we read in our ethics classes back in the, I hate to say it, the 1980s. But it's still appropriate today. And the name of the book that we read in our ethics class at a Baptist university was Money, Sex, and Power. And basically the author's premise was that most of your ethical issues will come down to conflict over money, sex, or power, or any combination of the three. Well, what we see here is we see some people that, that are trying to preserve power. And don't, don't, don't miss out on this. There was a large financial risk for them as well if the Romans came down on them. There's a big difference between being favored by the Roman government and being out of favor with the Roman government. And so they were trying to preserve that power and that place. And so often in our day, we see a hostility towards the resurrection because it gets the way of our money, our power, or the sexual immorality that tends to rule in our world today. 
that people don't want to leave. Uh, listen, they don't want to come to Jesus because it means that they would have to leave a lifestyle that they fought to try and legitimize. Well, you can legitimize it with the media, but you cannot legitimize it with the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and what God would have you to be. Oh, we have to choose. You know, when I was a young Christian, we'd want to tell people, oh, just come to Jesus, come to Jesus. And people would say, well, no, I'll have to give up this and this and this. No, you don't have to give Well, I, I was immature, and I was telling them, no, you won't have to give up this. And I was trying to give them to say, oh, you're going to get saved and go to heaven. It's going to be wonderful. Well, but the truth of the matter is, if you really want to walk with Christ, you've got to give up this, this, and this. And the truth of the matter is, we do a disservice people to people telling them, oh, here's the four spiritual laws. Come to Jesus. It's all going to be hunky-dory. Nothing in your life will change, but you'll have good fire insurance. That doesn't work. Right, listen, I, I got, I got, there was a popular pastor that tweeted out, he goes, coming to Jesus doesn't change who you are. It just reveals who God intended you to be. No, it changes who you are. Yeah, listen, I believe it when Paul says, if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. I believe that. Why? Well, it's in my Bible. It's the Word of God. Why would I dispute that? And so, yeah, I, it might reveal who God intended to me, me to be, but who God intended to me, me to be was not the sinner I was born as, but the child of God that he has created as a new creation. And so oftentimes, listen, we, we want to, oh, just come to, no, listen, if you come to Jesus, it should shake your world. It should change your mind. It should change your heart. It should change who you are, how you relate to others, what you believe in, what you value, who you value. There's a great deal of hostility and conflict to those who speak the truth about who Jesus is and what coming to Jesus means. Because coming to Jesus means leaving all of this mess behind and saying that I believe the Holy Spirit can empower me to have victory over that and to carry me through and to set me free. Hostility towards the resurrection is a recognition of God and the fact that I am not God. The resurrection forces me to turn my back on my me stuff. I have to confess my sin and my sinnership. I have to change my heart, attitudes, ethics, and everything because the resurrection changes everything. There's a second group in here. And it's those that would go to tell the Pharisees. And we kind of looked at the Pharisees and the high priests and all the people in power. But there were those who saw this great miracle and said, oh, we've got to go tell them. And these are the people that uh, I would call the indifferent or the consumer. Now, throughout Jesus' ministry, you will see people who were life-changing for them. Right? He fed 5,000. Follow him anywhere because they thought they were getting free lunch. And then the next thing he does is he starts off on all this hard teaching and they all leave him. Well, that's right. No, we just want the free lunch. Tell us how good we are. Make us feel good about life. No, the hard stuff comes along, we're out of here. Again, the more things change... Guys, we have to get away from doing attractive events and get into developing disciples. My, my old college professor, Dr. Bob Evans. Dr. Bob Evans was famous for telling me, young man in my class, you will stay awake or stay away. And, uh, and so... But the one thing I remember, he says, boys, if you get them in church with a circus, you're going to have to make church a circus to keep them. And, and, and yeah, Jesus did miracles, but Jesus did purposeful miracles to heal people, to help people, to point them.
to faith. Does God still do signs and wonders? Heck yeah. Always has, always will. But your faith is based on one sign and one wonder. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And after the blood of Jesus, that's all the sign that you need. And that's all the sign you'll ever need. They were consumers. The thrill seeker. Give us the show. Give us the dramatic. Oh man, that was dramatic. Man, you go to the grave. The guy's been in there. He goes, roll the stone away. Oh, it's going to stink. No, no, no. Lazarus, come forth. Now, I don't know he said it that way, but in my sanctified imagination, I imagine the drama, you know, and here comes this guy that's been dead for four days, stumbling out, wrapped up, bound up like a mummy, got spices wrong with me, and he's unbind him, said, boy, that's dramatic, isn't it? What's the next big show? The consumers, give us the wine, give us the bread, the thrill seeker, give us the show. But you know what? Jesus condemned the, uh, the indifference of the people of his day. He, he condemned the indifference of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, who'd heard much teaching and witnessed many miracles, and he said that their indifference was worse than the immorality of pagan Tyre and Sidon, even comparing them to Gomorrah. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 through 24. Then he proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. See that word? Repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted in heaven? You will go down to Hades. For if the miracles were done in you, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until the day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. If you go back to a Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 20, What does he say? I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm, spew you out or I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And so he says, listen, your indifference is death. It's destroying. I can't be indifferent to who Jesus is. I can't be indifferent to the, 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 uh, the claims of the gospel. And, and it's really, it's the difference between casual fans and fanatics. And guys, we need to be Jesus fanatics. Now, when we first moved down here, uh, one June, uh, Tony and Les Spokane, and we, I, I remember driving them over and we're we're in the airport in San Diego, and, and they're, they're checking in and going in. I'm standing there, and a guy comes out, and he just got off the plane, and he's dressed like Superman. <laughs> and my thought was, if he's Superman, why does he need a plane? <laughs> All right, you know, that's my logic, the way I think on this stuff. No, I don't. And, a couple of Jedi masters come down, you know, you know, so, you know, some other, you know, and I realized it's Comic Con. It's Comic Con. So they got on the plane and they flew off. Well, I drove downtown because I wanted to see the show, you know, and there's there's Wookiees and people from cartoons and and you know. You know, all these different kind of things, and they're all dressed around. Now, here's the deal. I have seen every Star Wars movie. I've seen most of the superhero movies, the, the Marvel ones and all that. Yeah, I, you know, I read those when I was a kid. However, I don't have them on automatic redial. And I've never gone out in public dressed like Spider-Man. 
And that's something we should all be thankful for. But I want you to think, uh, put this in perspective. Here's a guy that's walking through an airport dressed like Superman. He might be a fanatic. Well, what about me? How am I walking down the street? What sets me apart from anybody else in the world? Am I bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Am I sharing a testimony of God's love and His grace? Am I willing to run, uh, to, to walk out, walk through an airport call, uh, and, and proclaiming, the, the, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father? See, we have gotten really good at developing casual fans. Oh, I've seen it. I agree with it. But we need to really consider how sold out am I? How sold out to it am I? Right? Indifference is destruction. Indifference is destruction has been a fertile breeding ground for casual Christianity, and that's very dangerous. I told you we we're going to go in reverse order, so now we get the good stuff. Look at verse 45 with me. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. Saving faith is always placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other avenue for salvation. Now this is a simpic Simple but critical statement. They heard, they saw, they believed in him. And this reinforces what John had emphasized throughout his gospel. Go to the next slide. Here we go. It's the primary emphasis of John. In John 1.12 he says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right or the power to become the children of God, even unto those who would believe in his name. Those who receive, those who believe, become the children of God. In John chapter 11, Jesus performed his first sign in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory, and his disciples did what? Believed in him. John 3, 16. This might be one we're familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. And anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he's not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Drop down in chapter 3, verse 26. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. The wrath of God remains. John chapter 4. Do you see a, a, a pattern developing? Verse 39 through 41. Now he's talking with Samaritans. He's met the woman at the well. He confronted her sin and her sinnership, and, and she believed in him, and now they believed in him. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said. When she testified, he told me everything I ever did. And therefore, when the Samaritans came, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. What happened? Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, but we've heard for ourselves and because we believe, what did they know? That this really is the Savior of the world. When they asked Jesus, what can we do to do the work of God in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29? What can we do to perform the works of God? And his reply, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one who he has sent. You see, the only acceptable response to the resurrection is belief and surrender. Did you hear that? The only acceptable response to the resurrection is belief and surrender. I need to believe that Jesus 
the living God. I need to believe in the power of the resurrection. I need to believe in Jesus as my Savior, and I need to surrender my life to his glory and his lordship. That I need to surrender all of who I am to his Holy Spirit and his will. And I'm going to warn you, this may cost you some grudges. This may cost you some anger. This may cost you from hatred. It might cost you some bitterness. It may not allow you to be a victim any longer. It might cost you some comfort. It might cost you some relationships. It may cost you some lifestyles, some habits, some attitude. But if I truly surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it will change my identity and my direction and my purpose here and hereafter, now and forever. Well, you can respond to the gospel, to the resurrection with hostility and conflict. You can be angry about it. You, and all that's going to do is you're just going to be shaking your fist in the face of God and come judgment day, you'll reap what you've sown. You can be indifferent to it. But Jesus said being indifferent to his word, being indifferent to the gospel, being indifferent to a relationship with God, is a very dangerous place to be. Or you can simply be like those who saw it, they heard it, they believed, and they lived like they believed it. That's who I want us to be. I want us to see what God's Word says. I want us to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and love God. I want us to live our lives like we believe and we know the power of the resurrection is real and it's working in us. So our final question is this. How will you respond to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ? How will you respond to the power of the resurrection? My friend, we cannot afford to be indifferent any longer. Our world is a disaster. There's craziness everywhere. I can't be indifferent to the claims of Christ on my life. I need to surrender. Have you received or rejected the testimony of the Son of God? Have you seen the power of the resurrection and believed?